Uh, we talk about this issue basically every week on the show. So let's get somebody who knows something about it. We're joined by six-time New York Times bestselling author Armin Katayan to talk about his new book with John Talty called The Price, What It Takes to Win in College Football's Era of Chaos. Uh, Armin, congratulations so much on the book. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a labor of love in a lot of ways. I mean, both John and I really you know, have a great affection for college football and college sports in general. And it was like hopping on a speeding train, a freight train that didn't really have any idea where it was going half the time. And I think, honestly, he still doesn't know where it's going. But um, we're really proud of the work. Um, I think, you know, college football fans, um, certainly people that are in the coaching profession, it really is a pretty deep dive into what the state of the game is right now. And, and it's called the price for a reason, because it's not just all the financial implications that are going on, the billions of dollars that are pouring in, but it's what we found to be even more um, humanizing and more um, powerful is it's just the it's the emotional price, the psychological toll, the, the physical toll that's being taken on people that really love this game and are devoting their lives to it and frankly don't know from one day to the next, you know, what they're going to be facing. You kind of built the plane while flying it as the sand shifted under your feet writing this book. And, and you said that you've never seen the amount of frustration, exhaustion, anger, and confusion that's going on right now. Talk about that from, you know, you talk to coaches and administrators. What is the feeling that they have? Because we often hear the player side and you're, you're told by the administrator or coach, well, that's what you get paid for. Just do your job. Talk about what's going yeah, on. That's, I, I think that's the sort of the trite phrase here. You know, you're making a lot of money. So, you know, shut up and just do your job. But I think when you really see like Jed Fish, um, Arizona is a big part. They're raising Arizona. The first chapter is called. And what Jed did there in three years is remarkable. Taking a team that I think was, was oh, had lost 12 straight games and lost their last game before Jed was hired, 70 to 7 to Arizona State in a rivalry game. So he was coming in at the, at the basement, the ground floor. But he said in his first year, he barely saw his wife, Amber and his, and his, and his children. And he had, he goes, I had to reset in the second year. And, and just to see Amber in the morning, like from five 30 to six 30 in the morning before he went to the office and have a cup of coffee with her. So he could just kind of feel like he was part of the family. And you hear that story time and time again. And I think, Look, we all know NIL is, has just thrown um, the sport into chaos, and that's understandable because it's long overdue that, that the athletes are sharing in the revenue now, that they are, they're so um, pivotally important in, in creating. But I think the portal is really what's just thrown a, a, a complete um, wrench into the, into the whole um, the whole structure of college sports and college college football in particular, because, you know, you guys well know, now they're trying to close that that uh, spring portal. Um, but you can't even set your roster. You know, you can come out of, out of spring practice and you think you've got, you know, a second string cornerback, a backup, who's really going to be good in a year or two. And right after that um, spring practice is over, he walks in your office and says, hey, coach, um, I think I'm going into the portal. Um, because he's already been contacted by certain schools that figure, oh, well, we can induce him to come to our program, whether it's a, an ACC school into the Big Ten or a, a MAC school into the SEC or um, American Athletic Conference, really up and coming player to go into the SEC or Big Ten. So that kind of chaos, that kind of uncertainty is just so draining. And, and even the compliance people that we talk to, you know, when the pandemic hit, the first places that got cut in the athletic departments were the compliance people because they're not really generating any revenue for, uh, for the school. They're just keeping them on the right track. Some of the SEC programs have, I don't know, six or seven compliance people, big departments. But if you're in a Mac school, you might have one or two compliance people and you lose one, but you're still facing all the same issues, a lesser degree, but the same issues that an SEC or a Big Ten or Big 12 schools facing. So it's just flat out exhausting. And what we tried to do, and I think we were very successful at it, is not only tell great stories, but personalize that prop that that the whole issue of the price. You know, there's so many just in the in the, the paragraph that you just said, there's so many different things that are causing chaos within college football from the portal and NIL being the two biggest ones. We had Ward Manual on 
the show oh. when it when the portal was just becoming a thing and he expressed his concerns about it but even his concerns back then pale in comparison to the number of doors that have been opened by the portal including these compliance problems what was your biggest takeaway from the athletic directors of what the biggest problems are with the portal but besides compliance it's interesting you know jeff because th the old school athletic directors were really the ones and i would put ward in the old school category they were the ones that that had to kind of keep the, the the three ring circus together they had they weren't just responsible to the head football coach they had 25 or 30 other sports that they were dealing with now, and, th and those people had a history with, with the league um, and, the, and the commissioners, whether it was Jim Delaney or Swafford, or you can go back to Mike Slive and people like that in the SEC, they had a real understanding of how things work. Now, what you have, you have a new generation of athletic directors that really are businessmen, and they're trying to keep this revenue train on track, and they're really not they don't have the experience and they don't really have the depth of knowledge to deal with this brave new world. And a lot of the old school athletic directors, it's just not worth it, worth it for them anymore. Um, they can go and consult or they can go do something else at, at a certain stage of their life. And you get these younger athletic directors who are really business minded and, and they're really not equipped at the moment to handle all this chaos. Um, you add in the collectives, you add in NIL, you add in um, lawsuits, um, you add in um, realignment, you add in you don't know from one month to the next whether um, you're going to be in the same conference maybe this year or going into next year. It's, it's, um, it's overwhelming. And I think the what we tried to do, Jeff, um, what we really tried to do, John and I, was was personalize that, whether it's, you know, John wrote some great chapters on, on, on Nick and on Kirby and on Jimbo Fisher and Jimmy Sexton, the most powerful, called the power broker, you guys know, far and away, the most powerful sports agent in college. And I was really focused on, on the NCAA and Michigan, um, Arizona, there's a bunch of great chapters on that. And then you also have you know, chapters on the collective and you have the summit that was in DC where all these stakeholders get together trying to find solutions. But when you walk away, when you, when you're depending on Congress, particularly this Congress, um, not exactly the bastion of bipartisanship to say the least, to solve some of your problems, that tells you how big your problems are and how, how, um, uh, how problematic things are going to be for you. You, you mention the realignment portion of this, and that plays into the TV deal portion of yeah. everything. Um, yeah. you, you write about the destruction of the Pac-12. Are we kind of on the verge of that with other conferences? You see Florida State and Clemson flirting with leaving yeah. the ACC, Connecticut flirting with leaving, where their TV deal is tied to Connecticut being in the conference. Uh, where are we yeah. going with this all next? I you. I think one of the most interesting chapters in the book, I loved working on it, and John and I collaborated on that pretty good, um, is really the destruction of a 108-year-old Conference of Champions in a matter of 48 to 72 hours, and really based on two things, wanton greed and complete self-interest. Um, SC was the, the, the dam that broke uh, for, the, for the conference. When SC decided to join the Big Ten, and you have, you know, um, no reason in the God's green earth, really, for a school on the West Coast to want to be part of a Midwest conference, other than Fox television money, the grant of rights money, which is so powerful now that in many ways, I think that the networks taking advantage of their relationships with the leagues are really driving realignment. There's no question. And once SC, that first domino fell, they took UCLA with them, obviously, because of the market in L.A., and that's when Washington and Oregon started to circle around the, the Big Ten, and rightly so, um, Kevin Warren, and particularly Fox, Fox convincing Kevin Warren, the then commissioner of the Big Ten, to, to make an offer. And both Washington and first Washington and then Oregon um, accepting $30 million each 
in order to make the jump to the Big Ten. Well, that's all about the money. I, I talked to one ESPN executive who said, um, when they say it's not about the money, it's totally about the money. And that's exactly what it was. And Bobby Robbins, the president of Arizona, who I call in my own head, and I mean, he's like the solutionist. He was always trying to find a reason to keep that conference together. And he did everything he possibly could. But then he hears Carol Folt, who's the president of SC, saying, well, there's no way we would take any PAC or any Big 12 schools because those aren't the schools that that really can measure up to what a Pac-12 school is. Um, okay. Um, but meanwhile, she's talking behind Bobby's back and the rest of the other people in the conference's back with the Big Ten. So on one side of her mouth, she's saying one thing, and on the other side of her mouth, she's saying something else. And she's the first one to jump. And when she jumped, as I said, it was Katie bar the door at that time. And yeah, I worry right now, I mean, there's already talk, you guys know this, will it be the power two? Will it be the Big Ten and the SEC that break away, create their own set of rules, create their own um, division, the power two? Um, I worry about if that happens, you know, the Michigans and the Ohio States and the Tennessees and every, all the you know, we can talk about the Blue Bloods. They're all going to be fine. I worry about what happens to the Central Michigans. I went to San Diego State. San Diego State is is one of those that's, you know, really treading water right now in terms of a conference and an affiliation. They make, you know, a pittance in, in media rights, uh, grant of rights money. I don't know what's going to happen to those conferences. I think what you're going to find if, if things go the wrong way, if self-interest is still the driving force and money is the driving force, you're going to see, um, I, I, th I, I think you could see a destruction of some of those smaller conferences for sure. Armin, one of the takeaways I got from the book is, is how complicated all this is. It's not just the leagues. It's not just the schools. It's, it's government, it's politics, it's money, even though they say it's not the money. You know, yeah. in, in, in one of your chapters, the, I found fascinating was the summit. And, yeah. and there's a quote from the person that you just mentioned, the University of Arizona's uh, Robert Robbins, that he was a surgeon. And he said his his main line of, of thinking is always never panic. Yeah. From, from everything that you learned, is it time to panic? And, and well, are people yeah. like that, him now saying, you know what, it's time to panic? Yeah, no, he um, when I saw him again. Um, you know, he had this other great line, we're in the ICU, you know, we're in the intensive care unit. And that's what he said in in June of 23. Um, he said it to me the night before we had a, an interview at, at a at a hotel bar, um, the Willard Hotel, a classic bar in D.C. And first time I had met Bobby and I, I just um, was so impressed with with him. And, and um, it's unfortunate he's leaving now. The University of Arizona because he's just sick and tired of dealing with the faculty and all the stuff that he's got to deal with there. And that's unfortunate. But um, I think he, when I saw him in September of 2023, he goes, we're even worse. I mean, you know, we've got the, the paddles on right now. So I, I think it is time to panic. Um, I, I like what Charlie Baker is doing. I think he's a pragmatist. He's a political pragmatist. He's not um, married to any one major idea or um, direction. He, he has a framework that he wants, but he's willing to work within that framework. The question is, will the Greg Sankeys of the world and will the Tony Petitis of the world, uh, you know, obviously the SEC commissioner and the Big Ten commissioner, will they put the conference's self-interest aside in order to work together for a greater good? By that, I mean, you know, sort of some sort of national NIL policy where everybody has some kind of transparency and will there be some certification of the agents that are now operating really in kind of in the wild, wild west? I mean, I could be an NIL agent at this point. You guys could be NIL agents at this point in time. There's no credibility and there's no um, sanctioning of, um, of, of those kinds of people. So um, unless one of two things is going to happen. There's either going to be kind of an Oppenheimer kind of an event, an atomic bomb that's going to go off, and that will, the collateral damage will be so big, people will go, oh my God, we can't have this happen again. We have to come together and find a solution. Or 
It it's, hasn't gone off yet? Well, it went off. The first the first fuse was lit at A&M. You know, when NIL oh. started and, and, and uh, Jimbo and those boys down there in, in College Station, somebody said to me, and the, the person who knows what he's talking about, um, at, at an agency in L.A. who deals with this stuff all day long, he goes, when A&M got involved, they had the booster network, they had the athletic director, they had the president, they had the facilities, they had, they had the wherewithal and the will to win a national championship. And when that hit, everybody else around the room, all the other big boys said, well, holy shit, we've got, look what A&M's doing. So, okay, we're all in, whether it was Division Street with, with Oregon or whether it was what was going on at Tennessee or John Ruiz down in Miami, you can name a half a dozen of them. They're like, okay, baby, there's no rules. We can do whatever the hell we want. Game on. And that was the beginning of it. But you saw what happened at A&M. The, uh, Jimbo lost his job, but the culture there was so infected with the recruits coming in, bragging about the money they were getting, and competing against guys who were already starters who weren't making chopped liver at that point in time. And that just destroyed the chemistry and the culture of the team. And that's another thing these coaches have to deal with. But I think that, yeah, I think the first bomb went off in in um, in College Station with Texas A&M. And now you look just their neighbor over to the, where are they? Over to the north is you've got Texas with Sarkeesian. And those boys have pretty big wallets too. And you saw those Lamborghinis lined up. <laughs> yeah, those Lamborghinis lined up outside the athletic department. If that's not a show of force, I don't know what is. You mean Harbaugh so, wasn't going to line up Lamborghinis at Michigan? I mean, I got a Michigan man as a co-host here. I didn't even get. We no, I think Michigan have problems. I think Michigan's collective is really. There's too many collectives at Michigan. You got five collectives. You got Champion Circle, um, and then you have Valiant. You have Stadium in Maine. You've got other ones. Hail Impact. You can't have five collectives, even with Michigan's power and the prestige and the the brand, um, you're really you're really swimming upstream because you don't have everybody has their own self interest. Champion Circle, yes, has the the imprimatur of the athletic department, but am I am I the donor? Well, if, why should I give the stadium in Maine? Why should I give the Champion Circle? And I think Ward, the athletic director, Ward Manuel, was really slow. We report that in the book. Words like methodical to use to describe Ward's approach. Others would use the word obstructionist to describe his approach and his strained relationship with Jim Harbaugh adding to the equation. So um, I really like what they did with Sharon Moore. I think that team last year was a band of brothers that deserved in every sense of the word winning a national championship um, because they stayed together and they fought together and they worked out together to achieve a national champion. But I look down the line and if you don't have a collective that's aligned with your athletic department and you're in lockstep and one kind of beating heart, um, you're going to be at a disadvantage, uh, even though you have everything else that Michigan has to offer. You know, the NIL, that brand is one thing, but you still have to have collective money um, just, to, I think, to just keep things even with some of the really um, power players. Well, if people want to try and make chaos of what's going on in college football right now, you need to get this book, The Price, What It Takes to Win in College Football's Era of Chaos. Arma Katayan, thank you so much for the time. Hey, guys. We'll talk to you sometime My pleasure. in the future. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.